Okay guys, here we are right here at Kang Ridge and uh, this is the remarkable pulpit uh, in this old primitive church. And we're so honored and blessed and excited. Every time I come here, I get so excited and I can't wait to bring you guys here with us. So, uh, this is, we're up in the balcony area here at uh, Kang Ridge and uh, beautiful little doors here on each end of the uh, building. As you can see, this is a original building, like James said, for the most part, it has been preserved. It, work has had to be done to it for it to be preserved. And, but by and large, it remains uh, very much like it would have been. And there's looking down on the pulpit area, which is pretty remarkable. And you can see all the way over to the other James. end. I know that the balcony was torn out and as I recall, we're just doing all this impromptu, but as I recall, uh, the, the balcony was out for a number of years and they actually rediscovered that it had been stored in a barn or something locally, is that correct? It was removed in 1829 and used as a hayloft in a barn for almost 100 years. Uh, the family always knew where it was and in 18, uh, 1932, when the building was restored, they took it out of the barn and brought it back. And except for a handful of pieces, it is generally the, the original balcony, although there were no stairs originally. They climbed ladders through those windows. All right, the and originally, the uh, balcony would have been reserved for the slaves. Is that correct? Right. And um, there would have been no stairs so they would have entered, I'm, I'm assuming James, they would have put a ladder up yes. or something to the exterior of the building and would have come through, I guess, I suppose, either one or the other of the doors at the end of the building. Yes. And so this balcony here that I'm now standing in would have been full of uh, slaves in that time who um, would have attended uh, this remarkable place. Well, so I'd like maybe for a moment, uh, James, if you would kind of introduce yourself to us and um, talk to us a little bit about um, some of the history or the significant things that you feel like uh, might be good to emphasize to us today. Would you do that? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, my name is James Trader. I'm an ordained minister with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I uh, became curator here a little over ten and a half years ago. The building itself uh, was built in 1791 as a Presbyterian church, and this congregation moved here from North Carolina uh, on Daniel Boone's advice, so we have that link as well. They were uh, a, a strong Presbyterian congregation, but there was some inner turmoil in the mid 1790s because their minister was asked to leave by the Presbyterian Church because he was known to be drunk in public. And many of the congregation uh, left with him in 1796 when he moved to Ohio. Uh, so that left this church in dire need of a pastor. And at that point, a young man named Barton Warren Stone showed up here and uh, was essentially uh, stranded in Kentucky for a little while because his horse had become lame but he was a uh, Presbyterian minister and he appealed to the local Presbytery for something to do for that interim winter period before he could get back uh, to his home in North Carolina and the congregations both liked him so much they asked if he would stay so he was ordained and became pastor of this church and another small church about 10 miles away called the Concord Church. Stone would grow the church. Uh, in the first few months, they say he added 30 members to this congregation and 50 members to the Concord Church and was apparently quite liked by everyone around, not only his own congregation, but those outside of the Presbyterian Church as well. Stone became interested in what was going on in uh, the, the southern part of the state. Revivals were coming on. 
the Red River, the Muddy River, and the Gasper River meeting houses down in Logan County were the site of several revivals uh, before what happened here at Cane Ridge. Stone went down to, to observe one at the Red River with a minister he knew named James uh, McGrady and liked what he saw and decided to come back to Bourbon County and do the same thing. So he held a revival over at the Concord Church in June of 1801. They say only six or 7,000 people showed up and he decided to do it again. So in August of 1801, he held his revival here at Cane Ridge in conjunction with the Presbyterian sacramental season, the time when they took communion. It was often a yearly event at each congregation. That revival would be uh, well known throughout the country because partly because of its size. Some estimates say 20 to 30,000 people. We tend to lean toward that 20,000 number, but some have even put it higher. And they were here for a week in August of 1801. That revival was significant because it was part of that Second Great Awakening and it was uh, one of the largest revivals of that entire era. This revival was unlike anything they had ever seen before. While they had some of what they termed exercises or manifestations at other revivals, the numbers here were staggering. And so that's why it got so much press. James, I want to step back in for a moment. I'd like to talk to you. Every time I get with James, I just love it because he really is, a, he's, he has a practical working knowledge of the history, not just of this place, but uh, if you talk to him more of many tenants that have come out from this leading into uh, Cane Ridge and out of Cane Ridge uh, at that time. One of the things that I've been in, and I know that, um, you know, like you said, Barton Stone and James McGrady down at Red River and Gasper River, and we've been down there and we love it. And, um, but you mentioned something particular about the sacramental season. And uh, I know that really the, and correct me if I'm wrong, as I understand it, the primary focal gathering, even with Barton Stone here when he did in August uh, at Cane Ridge in 1801, that by and large was for the purpose of the sacrament. Yes. And what I have been able to read, and we're just going to do this now where we're just, because I don't know if, what I've learned is right or not. And so we'll just kind of go with this a little bit. What I understand, what I've been able to trace is that this sacramental season was typically a, about a four day event or exercise. With, like all right. And, I, and, and some of the, what I was reading is that it, its roots may be uh, from Scotland mm -hmm. and many of those who migrated to the early uh, continent, the early nation here, uh, carried many of those traditions with them. I know that uh, McGrady, he was born in Pennsylvania, but I believe his parents were from Scotland, as I've read his story. And in his story, he talks about in Scotland, they had a four day um, exercise that I believe in Scotland, they called a holy fair. That, that was a term that was used uh, in association with the sacramental season, but it wasn't exactly the sacrament. It was a, uh, a fair, a, right. a, a raucous party uh, uh, around was, that. that. That was all centered around yeah. the sacrament, right, of, right. of, of communion. Right. And uh, which is really a pretty amazing thing because in many of the churches of these guys that may be watching, the, that sacrament of Holy Communion is not really nearly uh, reverenced or followed as much as your tradition and your faith, uh, you know, does that. And I think we really need to have a restoration, if you will, of the validity, the value, the significance of the Holy Sacrament. And when we think about a fair even if it's a raucous community event, um, a three or four day event centered around the Holy Sacrament, that really is kind of uh, startling 
for many today when they think about typical church life in America today. Um, one of the things that I read, and I just wanted to see if you had any knowledge of this, and he and I have not uh, discussed this before, so we're just kind of going here off the whim, but one of the things that I had read about that four-day period was that they would kind of break the days down into a particular emphasis on that for leading up to the central part of the gathering, which was the Holy Sacrament. And what I read was like day number one, they would there would be a real emphasis upon repentance, upon humility, upon preparation, if you will, coming in towards the Holy Sacrament. Um, the second day was on uh, expository preaching or teaching of the word of the Lord. So the second day really brought in a strong foundational fundamental biblical teaching on the sacrament and the Christian life and that kind of thing. So the second day <clears throat> kind of really focused on that. Third day would have been the day of the sacrament. Yeah. And then the fourth day would have been a day for raucous celebration. Now, do you have? Have you well, looked at that at all? I, I wouldn't uh, characterize the fourth day as as the, as the raucous celebration of sanctioned by the church. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they, they would have been utterly opposed to that. Uh, sometimes the the celebration had to go to four days simply because of the numbers, because it invited Presbyterians from a, a fairly large geographic area. Right. And it often uh, required. Uh, logistically a much larger area or if it happened to be indoors like this one might have been although the records are a little sketchy uh, <coughs> they could not have fit 800 to 1100 people in here at one time sure so the celebration may have had to go on for four days out of necessity there was also the pre uh, sacrament um, responsibilities of the elders of the church that was to examine every member of the congregation. Yeah. Now, on the frontier, <coughs> again by necessity, some of that started to fall away about this same time. So it's a little unclear as to how well they followed that. But for weeks or, or possibly even months leading up to the celebration, they would examine every member. And uh, this was a, a, a confrontational kind of thing where they would sit in front of their elders and have to answer questions. And if they were found to be unworthy in any way, um, then they might not be allowed to take communion. In uh, Scotland and in the early days here in America, they handed out tokens. Tokens, right. Uh, often a piece of lead, and on the frontier it sometimes became a piece of wood, just depending right. on what they could, could get. And you had to present that on the day of communion because it showed you were accepted that practice did begin to wane about this same time so it's unclear if it happened at the revival what we suspect is rather than having the token every single time if an elder of your own church could vouch for you i say probably let you in the door <clears throat> right but only those who were uh, uh, found worthy could partake of communion and others could hear the sermons and all that sure but if you were going to be allowed what they called fencing the table if you were allowed right. past the fence you had to have that and i was going to say a moment ago in some of my study they found out where literally they would rope areas off and right. and um you know and and the other thing too is i think it's pretty remarkable for us to remember how that you compare that to the modern church and how many times very lackadaisically, that's a, that's, that's a, I'm not sure that's a word, but how kind of um, casually that we approach the Holy Sacrament, mm -hmm. you know, that in contrast to how in that time and before, and sometimes that examination that you talk about, it was not a flippant no. small thing to go before the elders and to be examined, yeah. you know, and um, so just if you showed up, doesn't mean automatically that you're going to get to participate in the communion 
right. you know, at all. Guys, no. anytime y'all come to Kentucky, you can't come to Kentucky and not come to Cane Ridge. And you cannot come to Cane Ridge without James. So he's the gatekeeper of the house. He's a wonderful man, and we just appreciate him so much. So when you come, be sure and introduce yourself to uh, James and let him know how much you appreciate him uh, safeguarding and keeping this amazing house. And uh, we'll be right back to you. Thank you, James, for joining us here. Thank you. Okay, come, come go with me here. We're gonna go uh, out the door. And uh, as, as you can see here, when we step outside of the old log church, uh, they built this wonderful shrine uh, building over top of, of the Cane Ridge Meeting House. And so literally, the old meeting house from 1791 is actually now sitting inside of this exterior building, which is uh, really a beautiful building all within itself. So come on around this way and we'll get a few last pictures you can see here. Uh, some of the old benches that, that uh, are types, I'm, I'm sure, of what may have been used here uh, in uh, Cane Ridge. This pew here was uh, actually, this was a part of Cane Ridge, right? Uh, in uh, 1829, is that what the sign right. said? And so this would have actually been a pew. And uh, we're gonna be taking a few pictures in the time we have remaining. And uh, so that you can uh, share and see some of the remarkable things that, that uh, are happening here uh, in this place. And then let's go outside, okay? We're gonna go outside and um, you can see also James and, and his staff here really do a remarkable job keeping up the grounds. It's always so beautiful here every time we come. And uh, this is the beautiful cemetery uh, here at Cane Ridge. And uh, it's just really a great, great, remarkable, wonderful place. And so uh, we want to give you a little bit of a look of that today. And uh, when we get to Philadelphia, uh, leaving tomorrow, then we want to also uh, visit wonderful places where the Lord has come and touched the hearts and lives of people that have made a great difference uh, in a community, in a church, or even in our nation. So uh, thank you guys for joining us right here on the grounds of Cane Ridge, and uh, we look forward to serving you and to seeing you soon. So God bless you, and we'll see you soon.